five verses. Good job, Ed. Good to see you. everybody. Good crowd today. Anybody in here need exercise? <laughs> Not exercised. Now, I, I think a lot of us need to be exercised. <laughs> I, I hopefully nobody in here needs to be exorcised. Exorcised. By the way, I don't, I don't remember checking the spelling on anything I put up here. So I tell you what, if you see something misspelled, everybody point at it. <laughs> and that way I'll know it, I'll know it's up there. Exorcised means to drive out or attempt to drive out an evil spirit from a person or place. One of the things we've got to admit is that there was indeed at one time a time when people were actually possessed of, of demons. That word possessed, I, I looked it up, did a study on it. It's found 24 times in the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, every time you read the word possessed, that word is referring to either property that somebody owned, owned or to something physical that somebody owned or it could refer to a person such as God possesses certain people who are His, His children. God possesses. Or sometimes in the Old Testament, a phrase, a, a slave was referred to as being possessed by that slave's owner. You know, we use the word today. I, I could say I bought a knife and, and that knife became my possession. Sure. In the New Testament, the word possession is found 15 times. 13 of those times, that word possession refers to a person or persons who are possessed by either a demon or in one case what's referred to as a legion of demons. That word possessed in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, it means owned. So there was a time in history when demons were permitted to inhabit and control the bodies of individuals who lived here upon the earth. Now remember, it, and it's true, I said in the Old Testament where, where possession is mentioned, it, it never deals with the idea of being demon-possessed. You might think that Pharaoh in Egypt might have been possessed whenever he refused to let the Israelites go even after God had, had put upon him those Ten plagues. But, you know, it was just the hard-headedness of Pharaoh. God wasn't going to tell him what to do. Had nothing to do with, with demon possession. A person might think that whenever Saul attempted to kill David by throwing the javelin at David, that, that he was demon-possessed, but, but that's not right either. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we, re, we read about this, how that Saul, the king, wanted David to be put to death. And it does say there that, that Saul had an evil spirit, but if we study it, if we look at it, we find out exactly what's going on. We back up a little bit, we see what's just taken place, and why, why Saul had the attitude that he had towards David, why it is that, it's, that he's described as having that evil spirit, that's what rightly dividing the word of truth is. Isn't it? If we go back to 1 Samuel 15, we find there Saul disobeying the commandments of God. 
God told Saul, you take your army, you go to the land of the Amalekites, and you destroy everybody and everything that's there. But Saul didn't. Remember, he saved some of them. He said he wanted to use them as sacrifices to God, but that's not what God had said for him to do. Therefore, Saul had disobeyed the Lord God. And as a result of this disobedience to the commands of the Almighty, Saul lost the throne of Israel that he had originally been blessed with. Now, the youngest son of Jesse, a fellow by the name of David, thank you, David got anointed by Samuel, the judge of Israel, to become the new king. And whenever David was anointed to become the new king, even though Saul was still considered as king, we see a whole new attitude exhibited by Saul. We read from 1 Samuel 16, 14 about this change of attitude that Saul had. It said, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now some people have read this verse and they've come to the conclusion that God put a demon in Saul, possessed him with a demon, and thus caused him to become the ungodly man he became. But upon, if we look at it closer, we find that what this verse is saying is that when Saul realized that he had been rejected by the Lord, that he began himself to have evil thoughts about what God had done. And he began to have evil thoughts about how God had rejected him, but accepted David. Nothing there about Saul being demon possessed. So as we study from the Old Testament, we don't find anyone there being demon possessed. Did you ever wonder why? It's so simple. Who in the Old Testament could cast out demons? Nobody. God's not going to put on what can't be taken care of. Right? He's not going to permit what can't be taken care of. All right, we come to the New Testament and we found out that there were 13 times that we find people demon-possessed. Why in the New Testament? Now, do we suddenly see demon possession? Well, because when Christ came to earth, suddenly there was one who had the power over the evil one and over all demons and could cast those demons out. Let's look at some of the examples found in the Word of God in the New Testament. Very early in the teaching and ministry of our precious Lord, we find Him having power and authority over the demons that had overtaken some in Capernaum. The occasion starts off. Jesus is in the village of Capernaum on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and He enters there into the synagogue, and as was His custom, Whenever he went into the synagogue, he would take a scroll and he would begin to teach. His teaching was, was wonderful. His method of teaching astonished people because he didn't just teach them as somebody who was reading out of a book. He taught as though he had authority, and he did. He was the one who had made those books in the very first place by his commands. Well, in the synagogue at Capernaum, there was a man with unclean spirits. He was demon-possessed. And suddenly this man, who was overtaken by demons, cried out while Jesus was there in the synagogue. And we read in Mark 1, 24, this man saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Did you notice right off the bat? The demons knew who Jesus was. They didn't have to be introduced. They already knew. James, the physical brother of our Lord who wrote the book of James, made a statement in James 2 and verse 19. He said, Thou believest there's one God. 
Thou doest well. But now notice what he says. The devils also believe and tremble. That word tremble in that, in that verse is the Greek word friso. It means literally to be struck with extreme fear. These demons in the days when Jesus walked on the earth and in the days of the early church in the first century, they, they had almost free reign, it appears, to cause suffering. Now, we don't have any examples of a demon who had the ability to kill a human in the New Testament, but they could cause physical and psychological suffering. Now, remember in the book of Job, how that there Job told God that the earth, the devil told God that the only reason that Job was a righteous man was because he was rich. He had a maid. He had all this property. He had all these animals. He had he had his family, and that's why Job was such a righteous man. But the devil says, I'll tell you what, you take that stuff away from him and he'll curse you. And so it was that God permitted the devil to have certain things he could do to Job. But he couldn't kill him. Couldn't take his life. Alright, getting back to the man demon possessed in, in Capernaum. Jesus says to the demons this, he says, hold thy peace and come out of him. I want you to notice the results found in Mark 1, 26. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. I looked up that word torn. That's not a word we usually use whenever we talk about a person's, uh, uh, what they're doing. That word torn in the original language means to convulse or to bend out of normal shape. In other words, whenever people looked at this man who Jesus cast the demon out of, they recognized that something was going on. It was obvious something was happening to this man. The devil was leaving and was leaving by the authority of the Lord who has power over demons. Now, don't you dare go home today and say, Preacher says there's people demon possessed today. I'm not going to say that. And I don't believe that. Just using these as a part of our lesson to bring us up where we need to be. Let's look at something we saw earlier. We looked in the book of James. The devils believe. The devils believe and tremble. They know who Jesus is. They know who the Father is. Somebody might say, well, well why then if they know? Why don't they attempt to change and become followers of the Lord? Well, consider this. How many people do we know today who truly believe in God? That there is only one God. That He has a Son, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit, all of them are part of the, of the Godhead. How many people today truly believe in God, believe in the power of God, except that Jesus died for them upon the cross that they could become Christians by being obedient to the words of Christ, by being baptized for the forgiveness of sins and have that wonderful home in heaven waiting for them that they would just be faithful here upon this earth. How many people believe all those things that don't do anything about it? Yep. A person who has that type of faith and doesn't do anything about it. You know, you know who else has that type of faith? Yeah, the demons do. The devils do. Well, Jesus could do what none other could do. He could cast out demons. That's why we don't read about demon possession in the Old Testament. Nobody could cast them out. God's not going to leave us helpless. He's not, as long as time lasts. So on that Sabbath day in the synagogue in the, in, in the city of Capernaum, and then later on, on the same day in the city of Capernaum, and on the next day in another village that is unnamed in the Bible, our Lord worked casting out demons from those who were possessed or controlled by them. He and He alone could do that at that time. In Mark chapters 4 and 5, we read of a wonderful, beautiful happening. To begin with, Jesus and His apostles are on a ship. They're on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee on the northern part of Palestine. 
they had started out on the northern shore and they were traveling in in they were traveling in a south eastward direction. They were heading toward the land of the Gadarenes, or sometimes called the land of the Gergesenes. It was on, on that trip, on that journey, that Jesus had laid himself down on a pad and suddenly a storm erupted and, and the storm got so bad, the wind got so bad that the waves were actually coming into the boat. And the apostles begin to be afraid, thinking they might sink. So they go and they, they wake up Jesus and they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Well, Jesus gets up and He rebukes the wind. And He says to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. Totally. There was a great calm. They make it over to the land of the Gadarenes. Jesus and the apostles are immediately met there by a man with an unclean spirit who had come out of the tombs. That word tombs is an interesting word. You know words change in meaning over time? They do. Originally, the word translated as tomb meant any physical thing that reminded a person of one who had passed. How many of you have something at home? And whenever you look at it or you pick it up, it reminds you of somebody who's no longer with us. Well, originally, that would have been called a tomb. That's what the word tomb originally meant. Then, then in time, over the years, the word became to mean a stone or a monument that was placed over where a body had been buried. And then again, in time, the word changed in meaning to mean the actual spot where the person was Interred. A graveyard, we would call it today. Well, here was a man who dwelt in the graveyard. He came to meet Jesus. Man had supernatural strength as a result of demon possession. He had been chained. It had fetters around his feet. But he broke the fetters and he broke the chains. No one could control this poor man. Day and night in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he sees Jesus... He runs to Jesus and worships Him, the Bible says. He fell at His feet. And this poor demoniac cries out with a loud voice and says that which is recorded in Mark 5, 7, What have I to do with Thee, Jesus, Thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure Thee by God that Thou torment me not. This demon-possessed man simply implores, begs the Lord, He asks the Lord to swear that He will not torture the demons that are in the man. Jesus had commanded the demons to leave the man. It is commonly believed that these demons thought that Jesus was going to cast them into hell. And they begged, they begged, do not torture us. Well, it was then that Jesus asked the demons, He said, what's your name? And the demon answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. I looked up during the days of Augustus Caesar, which was just before this time. A legion in the Roman army was made up of 6,826 soldiers. 6,100 soldiers, and the rest of them were horsemen who were soldiers. How many demons were in this poor man who was possessed? Well, we don't know, but a lot. The Lord cast him out of the man into a herd of swine numbering about 2,000. The swine run down a deep slope into the Sea of Galilee and they were drowned. Listen, Jesus has power over the demons. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus and His apostles go up north. They go to the edge of the land of Palestine, into the lands bordering Syria and Phoenicia. And there a Canaanite woman, a woman who was not a Jew, she was a Gentile, a Canaanite. She had a daughter who was demon-possessed and who had been suffering, suffering terribly as a result of this demon possession. And to this woman, Jesus said, whenever the woman came to Jesus and asked Him to heal her daughter, Jesus said, um, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Jesus had been sent to the tribes of Israel. Here was a non-Israelite Woman asking for help. But note what this woman who had faith in Christ said as recorded in Matthew 15, 27. She said, Yes, Lord. 
that even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the Master's table. Jesus said, Woman, you have great faith and granted her request to heal her daughter. Jesus came. And all, Jew, Gentile, woman, man, rich, poor, can take advantage of him and his sacrifice. Well, listen, demon possession doesn't exist today. We, we might see people and think they are, but, but they're really not. They're just mean, mean people. There's nobody today who could cast out those demons, so God would not permit them to take over a man's body today. <laughs> but in a sense, man does permit the devil to control him. I'm going to finish today by reading from a passage found in the New International Version. Romans 6, 16 and 17. Hear these words written by the inspired writer. Don't you know, he says, that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin and have become the slaves to righteousness. You know, everybody here today is enslaved. We're all slaves. We are either in slavery to, controlled by, obeying the devil, or we are enslaved to, controlled by, obeying the Lord. Somebody says, why well, I'm, I'm neither. Well, you can't be neither. You're either one side of the fence or you're on the other side of the fence. And the decision is toward totally yours. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Don't do the devil's bidding, but rather today do the bidding of the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you're here today, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Make up your mind that you're going to use your body to do the things the Lord wants you to do. That's repentance. Confess the name of Jesus before this audience of people be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're a child of God who has not done as you should, the invitation is given to you to come forward. And we would love to pray with you and for you in God's promise. He'll forgive. The invitation is yours. If you're subject to it, won't you come? There's a stranger